Holy moly, let's talk about a mole. All right, so the concept of a mole is oftentimes um, maybe maybe induces a little more anxiety than it ought to. Um, for example, if I ask you how many things are in a dozen, you would say 12, and you probably wouldn't be too afraid of that number. By the exact same reasoning, a mole works, it's just a set number of things. So for example, if I say how many things are in a mole, instead of 12 in a dozen, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things in a mole. And that's what a mole is. A mole is just a set number. When I say a mole, I say 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things. So if we, for example, if I say how many eggs are in a dozen, you say 12. If I say how many eggs are in a mole, you'd say 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Now I believe we did this in one of them, but if I do this, take it out of scientific notation, something like that. I might have been off by a zero or so, but this ends up being this number right here. So scientific notation is actually pretty important um, because this would be really annoying to write and this makes a lot of sense. But instead of 12, it's just a number. There's this many things in a mole, pretty big, but atoms are very, very small. So we need a tangible size to represent them. So for example, um, a mole of aluminum foil would sit in my hand, would fit in my hand, and be about this big. Um, a mole of water is, let me, hold on, I got some for you. I'm gonna drink, drink it down to about a mole. It's about that much water. If you can see inside the cup, about 18 grams of water. And so we have, uh, we use a mole because it makes it a tangible amount of something that we can see. So it says, let, so let's go ahead and mass out a mole of table salt. Let's see what the heck this even means. So you know what? I'm going to pause it. I'm going to actually go grab some table salt. Let's do this together, y'all. I wasn't planning on it, but I boom, like magic, we have um, a scale here. So I got a kitchen scale and I want to mass out a mole of table salt. Well, how the heck do I figure that out? Well, we have this beautiful thing called the periodic table. Boom shakalaka. And the periodic table has ev all the masses of all the elements. Well, the unit of mass is in grams per mole. In fact, let me write that down. The unit of mass is in grams per mole. Now, oftentimes we have difficulty understanding this, so let me go ahead and take a step back. If I say get 35 miles to the gallon in my car, if I got a gallon of gas, how many miles can I go? 35. If I go 35 miles, how many gallons have I used? One. So grams per mole tells you the amount of grams in a mole. If I got a mole, I've got that many grams. Let's take a look um, at table salt. So sodium chloride we should recognize as NaCl. That's because sodium has a plus one charge. Chloride has negative one charge. We only need one of each. And if I were to look at the masses of these things, sodium has a mass of 22.99 grams per mole. And chlorine is 35.45 grams per mole. So the mass of sodium chloride, we just add those up, and we get 58.44 grams per mole. So when I say, how many grams are in a mole? Hey, there are 58.44 grams in a mole, just because, just for the exact same reason that we use these units over here. It's the amount of something per something, 58.44 grams, and a mole. So if I say, hey, how much is a mole of table salt? It's 58.44 grams. Well, let's go ahead and figure out. I might actually not have enough salt. This is pretty low. Let's see what we got. Ooh, we're getting close. We're getting close. If I hit a quarter in there, you wouldn't know. Let's just pretend this thing's made of table salt. And 57, we're so close guys, we can do this. Oh, boom. Okay, so we got 58 grams of table salt. Let's just pretend it says 58.44. Unfortunately, this thing only has two sig figs and we only know it to the ones place. Okay, so if it's got 58 grams, how much is in there? Well, remember, that 58 grams was equivalent to a mole. So in other words, in this thing, pretending that we don't have Chase the dog buried in there, 
in this thing, if I were to say, awesome, how many, um, how many formula units, for example, it's slightly hydrostopic, so it kind of picks up a little bit of water. If I say how many um, molecules or atoms are in there, generally when we're talking about ionic compounds, instead of saying molecule, we use the term formula units. So let's say how many formula units are in there. And notice I, I, I represent formula units with F-U-N, um, not F-U. That could go badly on a video. So how many formula units are in there? Well, in 58.44 grams per mole, we had 58 grams. We know that that's the amount of a mole. In other words, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd formula units of sodium chloride in this one thing. There are this many formula units of sodium chloride in this tiny thing of salt. Is that insane? It's so cool. Okay, so I'm running out of pens here. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, now that we have a general idea of, of what a mole is, let's look at some conversion. So uh, you're gonna need to know how to go from grams to mole to molecule to atoms and back. Now, um, we just went, if I said, for example, how many moles are in 58.44, the grams, you knew it was one, so you already did some of that conversion already. But here's how I like to remember it. We're gonna go from grams to mole to molecule to atom, and you also should be able to convert all the way back. To go from grams to moles, this is when we're gonna need the molar mass. The molar mass has units of grams per mole. To go from mole to molecule, this is when we're gonna need 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecule in a mole. Be careful not to um, abbreviate molecule, M-O-L. You'll get very confused, obviously, very quickly. A mole is not a molecule. A mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things. So in this case, we're going from mole to molecule. We're talking about molecules, and that's why it's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. To go from molecule to atom, this just depends on the molecule. Let's do some examples to make sure that we understand what's going on here. Okay, so question number one says, how many mole are in 42.6 grams of carbon dioxide? So, I'm gonna start here, 42.6 grams. Now, carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide, it's CO2, carbon and two oxygens, it's a molecular formula, so we can use di, tri, et cetera. If we wanna look up the mass of this thing, which we're gonna need because we wanna go from gram to mole, so we're going from here to here, we've gotta use the molar mass, which is in grams per mole. So the molar mass of carbon dioxide, if you look at the periodic table, again, two decimals is fine. So the periodic table tells you carbon is 12.01 grams per mole. And I'll show you that right here. 12.01 grams per mole. Oxygen is 15.9999 which we would round to 16.00. And there's two of them, so we say plus two times 16.00 grams per mole. And that totals up to 44.01 grams per mole. So the molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams per mole. Oftentimes this will be given to you on an exam. This is rather elementary. I, unless I'm specifically asking for it, I generally will give it to you or try to give it to you to save some time. All right, so it says how many molar in 42.6 grams of carbon dioxide? First, let's take a second and think. If we had a mole, how many grams would it be? Well, if we had a mole of carbon dioxide, it'd be 44.01 grams. So we don't have that much, right? So we should automatically be expecting the answer to be less than one. Again, if we had one mole, it'd be 44.01 grams, but we don't have one mole because we have less than 44.01 grams. So we should have just less than a mole. So our, we should already have an idea of what's gonna happen. Now we can use dimensional analysis. If this is 44.2 or 42.6 grams, if this is grams, we have to put grams here. 44.01 grams. And then we put what's left up top, mole. Grams cancel. Now let's go ahead and calculate this out. 42.6 divided by 44.01. And I get an answer of 0.968.
mole. And hopefully that makes sense. So 0.968 is just a little bit less than one and that's kind of the answer that we are expecting. Now this first step is actually one of the most important things you're going to learn right now in general chemistry. Why that is, is because I want you to get used to the habit of every time you see grams, you turn it into moles. Every time you see grams, you turn it into moles. Grams, turn that stuff into mole right away in the middle of the problem because otherwise you're going to accidentally use grams and we can't do that, especially with the upcoming stuff that we'll learn here in a little bit, the rest of chapter three. So how I like to remember it, if you notice, we took the grams and we divided by the molar mass, right? So I sing a song, it goes like this. It's bad. To turn grams into moles, divide by molar mass. Grams into moles, divide by molar mass. Grams into moles, divide by molar mass. And if you don't, you're a pain in my... And that's what I like to sing. So the next question is how many molecules are in 42.6 grams of carbon dioxide? Well, we already went from grams to moles. Now it's asking us to go to molecules. Let's pretend we didn't do this first step, okay? And let's just start with what we got, 42.6 grams. Well, what do we do when we have grams? You immediately turn it into moles. So let's go ahead and start with that process. We know if this is grams, we've got to divide it. We have the molar mass here. And now we're in mole town. Now, another thing that I find to be important at this point, if you're going to convert any further, you want to actually write what you're converting. So we are talking about their 44.01 grams per mole carbon dioxide grant that's the mass of carbon dioxide so make sure that these two things count or match this is grams of co2 per mole of co2 now we're in mole town what i like to say and we got to go now from mole town to molecule town well, what do we need to go from mole to molecule 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole so if this is mole of co2 what has to go here mole of co2 so we put mole of co2 there and we're converting it into molecules how many molecules of co2 are in a mole of co2 ah 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd all right so now we can go ahead and move on we can say all right 42.6 um divided by 44.01 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd Gives me just under a mole, which is 5.83 times 10 to the 23rd. If you've got a slightly different answer, you might have used this number. Make sure you don't round in the middle of the problem. That will actually end up affecting your answer in the end. So we have 5.83 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of CO2. Okay. Now we can go ahead and, and move on to the next question. It says, how many atoms? So we're going from grams to mole to molecule to atoms now. Now it says to go from molecule to atom, it depends on the specific molecule. Let's talk about what we mean. So um, carbon dioxide is carbon and two oxygens, right? So if I were to actually draw it out, it would look like this. And we'll get to the individual bonding here in chapter nine. But it's a carbon atom bonded to two oxygen atoms. So if I have um, one molecule of CO2, how many total atoms do I have? Let's go ahead and go over here. Molecule and atoms. If you have one molecule, you got one, two, three atoms. If you had two molecules, you have one, two, three, and then you'd have that again. So you have a total of six atoms. If you got three molecules, how many atoms would you have? Nine. Can you notice that you're always multiplying by the number of atoms you got? So three times three is nine. Two times three is six. One times three is three. So you're always multiplying it by three. What if you had, I don't know, 80 molecules? 80 times three is 240 atoms. What if you had, I don't know, 5.83 times 10 to the 23rd? molecules, how many atoms would you have? Just because you have a big number now doesn't mean the pattern stops. Here we multiplied by three times three times three times three. This number would also be multiplied by three. But let's hope, go ahead and not have to worry about making charts and graphs. Let's go all the way back to our process that works every time. Grams to moles to molecules to atoms and pretend we know none of this and start there. All right, so 42.6 grams 
turn grams into moles, divide by molar mass. Keeping track of what we're talking about, that's CO2. Mole of CO2, we have to put mole of CO2 here. And we're turning a mole of CO2 into 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of CO2. And here's where it really gets important to be talking about what um, you're doing to write that CO2. Because now, if this is molecule of CO2, what has to go here? Molecule of CO2. And we're turning it into atoms. Not atoms of CO2, we're turning it into atoms. So in one molecule of CO2, how many atoms are there? Three. And that's how we introduce the times three element down here. So let's go ahead and do this from the top. So what I would do in my calculator is I'd say 42.6 grams times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd times 3 divided by 44.01 grams. Or any, any order as long as whatever is on the denominator gets div a division sign before it. And here I get... Here I get 1.75 times 10 to the 24. Total atoms. Our grams canceled, our mole of CO2 canceled, our molecules canceled. The only unit we had left was atoms. I'm going to do it one more time just to make sure I didn't make a mistake somewhere. 42.6. I'll go crazy. 42.6 divided by 44.01 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd times 3. And I still get 1.75 times 10 to the 25 or 20, 10 to the 24 atoms. All right, so this is a process to go from grams to mole to molecule to atom. The beautiful thing is you can actually go backwards as well. You can go from atom to molecule, molecule to mole, mole to gram. And what a great idea. Let's go ahead and make an example problem out of this. So I should have written an example here. Um, it says a sample of phosphoric acid. We should immediately know that phosphoric acid, it's not hydrophosphoric acid, it's phosphoric, telling us it comes from phosphate. Phosphate is PO4 with a 3 minus charge. To make it an acid, we got to add three hydrogens. And this is phosphoric acid, assuming it's aqueous. It says it contains 4.6 times 10 to the 24 oxygen atoms. Then it asks for the mass of the sample, and it gives you the molar mass of 97.99 grams per mole, which is what I said I really like to give you guys this, um, because it's really annoying to add up three hydrogens plus a phosphorus plus four oxygens, etc. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. We have 4.6 times 10 to the 24 oxygen atoms. We start with what we have. Now we want to go from atoms, follow the same pattern. We got to go from atom to molecule. Well, if this is oxygen atoms, what has to go down here? Oxygen atoms. And we're interested in turning into molecules of H3PO4. How many oxygen atoms are in a molecule of H3PO4? Ah, uh, there are four oxygen atoms in a molecule of H3PO4. Now we're in molecule town. We want to go from molecule town to mole town. To go from molecule to mole, that's when we need this conversion of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. So if this is molecule of phosphoric acid, we know that there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole of H3PO4. Just every once in a while keeping track of what you're talking about. All right, now we made it to Mole Town. We just want to make it all the way to, uh, to Mass Town, to Gram Town. I said Mass, I probably should have said in grams over here. Maybe I'll add that to your worksheet before I post this. Um, but essentially we just want to make sure that it's in grams. So now if this is mole of H3PO4, what has to go here? It's gotta be mole of H3PO4 and we're turning it into grams. In order to do that, we're gonna need the molar mass, which was given to you. There's 97.99 grams per mole of phosphoric acid. 
So let's go ahead and calculate that out and see what we get. There are many ways that you're going to do this. I hope that you do this on your calculator because what you're going to find is if you're not paying attention, you're going to accidentally not put this in parentheses. So right now I have 4.6. Actually, I'll use do times 10 to the 24. I don't normally do the exponents. I'm sending the 24 times 97.99 divided by 4 divided by 6.022 divided by 10 to the 23rd. And here I get an answer of 187 with sig figs. 187 grams with sig figs, that would be at 190 grams because I only wanted to have two sig figs because this one only had two. Two, infinite, four, and four. Two is the least of them, and that's why 190 uh, would be my final answer with appropriate significant figures. All right, so if you ended up with an answer that was, for example, times 10 to the 47, if you have 10 to the 47, what you did is you forgot that we need to put that in parentheses or tell your calculator that that should be in parentheses. It's a really common problem, and it's a question, an answer choice that I'd likely have on an exam just to see if you're making sure your math is right because that's a big deal if you end up getting a mass that's bigger than the mass of the Earth, for example. So, all right. Let's go ahead and move on. Oh, man, mass percent. I love mass percent. All right, I prefer in-class lectures on this because I have some fun stories I like to tell to lead into mass percent, but I'll save you guys a little bit of time. So just be like, ha, that was a great story, even though I didn't tell one. Wasn't it funny? It was awesome. Okay, so mass percent is essentially the amount of mass something takes up in a sample. So for example, if I asked um, for the mass percent of your thumb in your hand, um, you'd weigh the mass of your whole hand, including your thumb, you'd weigh the mass of your thumb, and you'd figure out what percent that mass of your thumb is for the whole system. In other words, mass percent equals the mass of whatever you're interested in divided by the total mass times 100%. Okay, so it asks for the mass percent of phosphorus in sodium phosphate. Well, first we have to know what sodium phosphate is. Um, sodium is Na plus, it's got a plus one charge, phosphorus is PO4, three minus, so telling us we need three sodiums to cancel out that phosphate, and sodium phosphate is Na3PO4. Now we already know the molar mass of this whole thing. It tells you it's 163.94 grams per mole. So what is the mass percent of phosphorus in sodium phosphate? Well, the mass of the thing we're interested in is phosphorus. So first we have to find the mass of phosphorus. We go and look on our periodic table over here. We say, hey, it's 30.97 grams per mole. So the mass percent is the mass of the thing that we're interested in, phosphorus, 30.97 grams per mole, divided by the total mass, 163.94 grams per mole, times 100%. So let's go ahead and do that. 30.97 divided by 163.94, and then times 100% looks to me to be about 18.89%. Now some questions you might have. In fact, let's go ahead and do this just to make sure that we understand. What if I asked you mass percent of oxygen in the same thing. Well, oxygen, we have four oxygens, right? So if I ask you for the mass percent of oxygen, I'm not saying, hey, what's the mass percent of one of them? I wanna know the mass percent of oxygen. So all the oxygen in there. So our mass percent in that situation would equal the mass of four oxygens, four times 16.00, divided by the total mass, 163.94, times 100%. So let's go ahead and do that. 64 divided by 163.94, and I get 39.04%. So 
let's make sure that's correct. Yep, and again, I get 39.04% oxygen. So keep in mind, if you have more than one thing, you multiply it by that number of things that you have. Okay, so how do we end up using mass percent? Well, first, before we get to that, we have to figure out what different structures there are, and then we can actually figure out how mass percent plays into understanding um, molecular formulas. So there are several different types of formulas. Let's talk about H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. Um, so hydrogen peroxide is a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, to another oxygen, and to another hydrogen. It looks something like this um, spatially. And there's like lone pairs of electrons. And again, we won't get into this until chapter nine or so. But what's important to recognize is that the structural formula tells you kind of how all this stuff is bonded together in a single molecule of hydrogen peroxide. The molecular formula is exactly what I wrote. It's H2O2. What it tells you is that in a single molecule, there are two hydrogens and two oxygens. So it tells you what's in a molecule. So molecular formula will tell you what's in a molecule. A structure tells you how things are bonded. We won't talk too much about that until later. And then we have an empirical formula. An empirical formula tells you relative ratios. It tells you relative ratios. Okay, so for example, there are two hydrogens and two oxygens in a single molecule, right? So if I only had one hydrogen, how many oxygens would I have? One. So essentially you take the, each num this um, subscript here and you divide them by the uh, lowest common denominator and we figure out that it's two and two and so we end up with HO, telling you for every one hydrogen, there's one oxygen. Again, here we had H2O2. We divided it by a common denominator, and here we get HO, um, H1O1, although we don't write the ones. So this would be the empirical formula telling you the relative ratios. For every one hydrogen, there's one oxygen. And that ends up being important in this next example here. So let's say I give you an empirical formula, and I want you to figure out the molecular formula. You would need the molar mass of the molecular formula in order to do that. Let's, let's do an example. I say here you have an empirical formula that is CH2. And I'm asking for a molecular formula. We don't have any idea what it is. But we do know a hint that it has a mass of 42.08 grams per mole. Well, let's look at the mass here of CH2. That's 12.01. I'll write it down. We're going to have 12.01 plus 2 times 1.008. And these are units of grams per mole. Why am I using 1.008? Because hydrogen, we often have lots of them, so I don't like to use two. This is the only time I'll use three decimal places, or three numbers past the decimals with hydrogen plus three times 1.008. And I get a mass of 15.034 grams per mole. And that doesn't make any sense. I have a typo. Okay, I see what I did. I put three in my calculator here because this should come out to 14.03. So let me go ahead and say 12.01 plus two times 1.08 is 14.03 grams per mole. Okay, so this is the mass of the empirical formula CH2. The molecular formula has to keep these ratios, telling you for every one carbon, there has to be two hydrogens, or twice the amount of hydrogens. 
but the only information we know is that the empirical formula has a mass of this and the molecular formula has a mass of that. Well, the only way we can keep those same ratios is by multiplying it by one single whole number. For example, the, if the molecular formula stayed the same, it would have a molar mass of 14.03. Let's say we multiplied it by two, so this is times one. If we multiplied it by two, then it would have to be C2H4. It still keeps that same empirical formula, right? And what would its molar mass have to be? It would have to be twice this. It would have to be 28.06, etc., etc., etc. So here we have a molar mass of 14.03. We need to get a molar mass of 42.08, keeping this ratio the same. All you do is say, hey, how many times bigger is this? than this original one, and the answer is three. Although you could do the math, you could say 42.08 divided by 14.03 gives you a number very close to three. It's 2.9999 or something. So that tells us our molecular formula has to be three times the amount of carbon and three times the amount of hydrogen, and that's how we end up getting our answer of C3H6. Okay, so our molecular formula would be C3. H6. It still has the same empirical formula. You can go back and forth. I can say, what's the empirical formula of C3H6? You divide each of these subscripts by three, and you'd end up with CH2. Okay, so molecular formula from empirical formula requires the molecular mass. All right, so let's put all this beautiful knowledge together now and figure out what's going on. So the question is, what is the empirical formula of a compound with the following mass percent composition? Mass percent, hey, we know what that is. It tells us the total mass. Well, there's a really easy way um, to do these problems that isn't so intuitive, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Obviously, that's kind of what the lecture is about. Um, anytime you have percent, you assume you have 100 grams. Now that can be kind of confusing, um, but if you have 100 grams of a sample and 13.60% of it is hydrogen, how many grams of hydrogen do you have? Oh, you got 13.60 grams. So essentially what I want you to do is anytime you have percent and it's asking about empirical or molecular formula, turn that percent into grams. You know what to do once you have grams. What do you have? What do you do when you have grams? Grams into moles divide by the molar mass. This is 13.60 grams of hydrogen. So I'm using the molar mass of hydrogen. I use three decimal places like I just did, 1.008 grams per mole. And that will tell me how many moles of hydrogen I have. So 13.6 divided by 1.008. And I get an answer of 13.49 more. Do the same thing with carbon, 64.82 divided by 12.01, and that gives me an answer of 5.397. I do the same thing with oxygen over here, 21.59 grams divided by 16.00 grams per mole. And I get an answer of 1.349 mole. Well, believe it or not, we actually have a lot of information now about what our actual empirical formula is. Because if these are our mass percents and these are our moles, what that is telling us is that, hey, this compound has a formula that is hydrogen 13.49, carbon 5.397, oxygen 1.349. How rad is that? But you know that these look funky. So essentially what we want to do is get to a whole number. I can already look at this and say, hey, there are, wait a second, there are 10 times the amount of hydrogens as there are oxygens, right? So you already have a general idea of what's going on, but let's put this in terms um, that the steps that we can follow every single time. To do that, you're going to divide by the smallest mole. So essentially this is 1.349, that's the smallest of 
all these three moles. So I'm going to divide by 1.349. This will give us a whole number of one for at least one of them. So again, this one will give us one. If I take 5.397 and I divide it by 1.349, I get an answer of four. It's actually 4.0007. Here, use, um, you're, you're just gonna have to use some kind of logical reasoning. If you get 2.999, it's gonna be three. If you get 3.001, it's gonna be three. Um, if you get 2.5, don't round that up. Um, if you get 2.5, then you're going to eventually have to multiply them all by 2. Okay, so here we get 13.49 divided by this, again, is 10. Now, all of a sudden, we've gotten some whole numbers. What that tells us is, hey, I have 10 hydrogens, 4 carbons, and 1 oxygen. Now, if I put this all together in an appropriate way that I should represent this, usually you want to put the carbon first, followed by the hydrogen and kind of go left to right on the periodic table, then oxygen. And this would be my empirical formula. Not my molecular, I don't have my molecular. How do you get your molecular? You need the molar mass, right? So this would be my empirical formula. This is actually um, butanol, and you can do some pretty cool stuff with butanol. It explodes and it's really fun, and we'll talk about that when I'm not being recorded. Okay. What is the molecular formula of a compound with the above mass percent? So in other words, now we've got this empirical, but it's asking for the molecular formula, and it gives you the molar mass of about 150. Well, we got C4, H10O, that's our empirical. We want to know what the molecular is. We don't know what it is, but we know that it has a mass of about 150 grams per mole. Well, if you added up the mass of this guy, let's go ahead and do it. Four times 12.01. Do this right here. Plus 10 times 1.008 plus a 16.00. I get that it's about 74 grams per mole. Well, how many times bigger is 150 from 74? Hey, two. It's two times bigger, telling us that the actual molecular formula is going to be twice the carbon, twice the hydrogen, and twice the oxygen, C8, H20, O2. And this would be our molecular formula of this compound. So um, if, if you didn't get all this, I would watch it again, then I would stop it. And I would try to do the whole thing on your own, making sure you understand every step of the way. Now, some people get bothered when I say about 150, but keep in mind, it can only be in multiples of 74. So when I say about 150, that I could have easily said between 130 and 160 or 130 and 170, and you still should have been able to get the answer. So the about shouldn't bother you. Um, in fact, that's the reason I do it is because I've seen uh, exams written that way. All right, so I think... We are closing the end for balancing reactions. I want you to do this on your own. I do provide videos, obviously, um, but I'd, I think a lot of people already have a general good idea, idea about how to balance reactions. So I'll just post some supplemental videos for you to watch if you need some help or some um, refreshing in terms of balancing reactions. That is the end of chapter three, part one. Part two will be upcoming. All right, y'all have a great week. Bye.